Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Institute for International and European Affairs this afternoon. I'd like to welcome in particular uh, Ambassador Norio Naruyama, the newly arrived Ambassador of Japan, uh, who is who is attending the Institute today for the first of what I hope will be many visits here uh, over the course of his time in Ireland. This event has been organized in conjunction with the Embassy of Japan and is being delivered to an in-person and an online audience. We're delighted to be joined today by Professor Michito Tsuruoka, Associate Professor at Keio University, who has been generous enough to take time out of a schedule to, to come all the way from Tokyo to Dublin to speak to us. Professor Tsuruoka will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will have a question and answer session with the audience. For those of you in the room, if you would like to ask a question, please put up your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. And for those of you joining us online, um, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them after Professor Tsuruoka has finished his presentation. And please be sure to include your name and affiliation with your question. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. So now let me formally introduce Professor Tsuruoka before giving him the floor. He is an associate professor at Keio University in Tokyo. He is concurrently a senior fellow at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research and a senior fellow at the Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy at the Brussels School of Governance. Before joining Keio in 2017, he was a senior research fellow at the National Institute for Defense Studies from 2009. And during this time, he was seconded to the Ministry of Defense as a deputy director of the International Policy Division, where he was in charge of multilateral security and defense cooperation in the Asia Pacific region. He also spent one year as a visiting fellow at the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies in London from 2013 to 2014. And before joining the National Institute for Defense Studies, he was a resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States in Brussels in 2009. And he served as an advisor for NATO at the Embassy of Japan in Belgium from 2005 until 2008. So he has a lot of experience of Europe as well as Japan and Asia. And I know that we are all looking forward very much to hearing his presentation. So without further ado, I will give you the floor. Yes, it's Thank you very much, Ambassador, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here. This is actually the very first time uh, to, to come to this beautiful city. And uh, so I'm very much delighted. So, so thank you very much for the organizers and of course the, the Ambassador Mariyama and the Embassy of Japan. The, so, so today's topic is uh, Europe and Asia in the wake of the war in Ukraine. So the, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the linkages, security linkages between the two regions and also the Japan's foreign security and defense policy, because uh, this is a great timing, because uh, just last, last, not last month, already we are in February, but uh, the, back in December last year, the Japan issued a new national security strategy along with national defense strategy and other uh, defense documents. So the, we are very much in the process of changing Japan's security and defense policy. And uh, this is very much in the context of the war in Ukraine. And, uh, and other 
regional uh, security development surrounding Japan. So the first, uh, let me start uh, saying by saying a few words on the on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its impact to Japan and to the to to the region. I mean, to the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific region. The Russia's invasion, to be quite frank, was a huge shock to Japan. And uh, but in the wake up in the run up to the invasion, the 24th of February last year, the Tokyo's awareness about the seriousness of the situation was not quite high. So the, yes, I understand that uh, the, the, at the end of, the, at the end of the 2021, the already in Europe, the, the people, everyone was talking about uh, Russia's mobilization and Russia's concentration of Russian forces near the, the, the border with Ukraine. But uh, in Japan, the, the people are not quite uh, much paying pay much attention to that. But uh, after the invasion, the situation and, uh, and the, the recognition in Japan suddenly changed. And, uh, and also the government uh, led by Prime Minister Kishida imposed an unprecedented level of economic sanctions on, on Russia. So the, but uh, the expectations to be quite honest about Japan's imposing sanctions on Russia were not quite high. And that is because of the experience of Japan's sanctions on Russia in the wake of the annexation of Crimea back in 2014. So at that time, the, the government by, uh, led by Prime Minister Abe was not quite enthusiastic about imposing sanctions on Russia because at the time he was very much committed to improve relations with Russia, hoping to get some islands back from Russia because the, between Japan and Russia, there are what we call Northern territories, the four islands between Hokkaido, the Northern part of Japan and Russia. And uh, the, the Prime Minister Abe was very much eager, committed to conclude a peace treaty with Russia. So he didn't want to squander all, the, all that possibility as a result of the annexation of Crimea. So the Japan imposed only nominal uh, set of sanctions back then. But this time, the scale of Russia's action and Russia's behavior and Russia's destruction and, uh, and the number of casualties in, in Ukraine, is very different from what happened in 2014. So the Japan, the, 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 the Prime Minister Kishida was very much committed to impose a very strong set of sanctions for the first time. And the second reason why this time Japan has reacted in a much stronger manner had to do with the fact that uh, the, we are now in, in Japanese mind, we see more direct linkage between what happens in Ukraine and what could happen in East Asia. So the, now the people are very much talking about the linkage between Ukraine and Taiwan contingency. Of course, the situation is not that simple. The, the Russians invading Ukraine doesn't necessarily mean that Chinese to, 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 to invade uh, Taiwan, but uh, the, this linkage is something that uh, we are very much aware of. And that is why Prime Minister Kishida has been saying that the Ukraine today could be East Asia tomorrow. And that's something that uh, the Prime Minister Kishida has been repeatedly emphasizing. So the, so the context within which Japan responds to this invasion, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this time is very different uh, from, from uh, what we saw back in uh, 2014. And uh, the, one of the, the messages that uh, the, the Kishida government has been, has been giving is that uh, the Japan is determined to align itself with other G7 partners. Because the group of seven, the G7, for Japan is really important. And uh, yes, it's a bit exclusive club, but uh, it is very much at the very center of Japan's foreign policy. Of course, they are, when it comes to security and defense, the alliance with the United States is the, is the biggest and uh, most important foundation. But uh, when it comes to foreign policy, including economic, international economic relations, the, the G7, the cooperation with uh, G7 is, is, a, is of prime importance. And, uh, and this year, actually, Japan is holding G7 presidency. So Japan is going to host uh, not only G7 summit, 
but also a series of uh, foreign ministers and other ministers meetings in Japan. And also the, the, the online meetings are supposed to be taking place as well. So the, so, so this uh, cooperation with G7 is, a, is something that uh, we are uh, very much committed to and uh, the, the defense resistance to, to Russia's invasion uh, is also very much uh, situated in, in, in that context. The, and also the, looking at the, the impact of this war and invasion to Japan's domestic uh, discussions of foreign security policy. That's also quite important and interesting because the, looking at uh, this war, the, the people in Japan, including ordinary people, not paying regular attention to international security issues, they have also realized how important it is to think about security and what it takes to defend a country and defend people. So the, this is something that uh, ordinary Japanese didn't quite think of for many, many, many years. But so now suddenly that, uh, we have to think about that. So the, and also the level of public interest in Japan in the war in Ukraine has been surprisingly high. This is a, as someone working on European security issues, this is a very surprising thing to be quite honest. So there have been, so for a few months uh, since the following the, 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 the start of this uh, invasion, I was sort of a, appearing on TV program uh, twice or three times a day. That's sort of a very crazy uh, uh, situation is there. And everyone is talking about uh, specific weapon systems or the high Mars and everyone is talking about high Mars or the the infant the, the fighting vehicles and it's it's quite new situation in Japan. So the I was quite surprised by to be quite honest by the, the high level of interest among the ordinary Japanese in, in in this war. And this has affected the evolution of Japan's discuss, domestic discussions on foreign security and defense policy. So the, I mentioned the fact that uh, the Japanese government issued a new national security strategy and national defense strategy last December. And it introduced a, I would say, set of revolutionary changes to post-war Japan's security and defense policy. So one of the most important and most controversial issues is the idea of increasing defense budget. So for a long time, Japan spent only 1% of GDP on defense. There was a sort of a political ceiling for a long, long time. So 1% of GDP, but uh, now suddenly that the government is committed to spend 2% of GDP on defense. But uh, the, there, there are some tricks behind that. So the, when we were talking about 1% of GDP, it was only about MOD, the Ministry of Defense budget. But now in the context of 2% of GDP, we are talking about it, including other security related budget items like uh, Coast Guard and uh, defense related research and development. But uh, so, so, so to, it's not that uh, we are going to spend 2% of GDP just for the Ministry of Defense, that's not the case, but, uh, but still, there's going to be a huge increase over the next uh, five years. So the, but people have been surprisingly supportive of that. Of course, the, where to find money is controversial, as you can imagine, but uh, the very idea of spending more money on defense it's somehow accepted by many people. So looking at opinion polls, the, the majority of Japanese still support that. But of course, when it comes to where to find money, still, that's a really controversial issue. And particularly, it's quite interesting that within the LDP, the ruling party, the Liberal Democratic Party, that's a ruling party, within the party, there are, there are so many uh, politicians who oppose the idea of increasing tax for that. The, 
And uh, there are so many people who argue that uh, we, we just can uh, issue more government bonds to, to fund uh, the increase of the defense budget. So, so, the, so there are various ways to prepare money for, for, for that. One is, of course, increasing tax, which is not quite popular, as you can imagine, but, and uh, borrowing more money. So the Eastern government bond, that's somehow quite popular among LDP ruling party politicians, and uh, the decreasing other budget items. Also, is that quite popular? <laughs> for, for those who could be affected uh, by that. And, uh, and uh, the optimists within the government say that uh, we can just uh, expect natural increase of revenue. Yes, of course, if that, that, that really happens, that, that, that's the best sort of solution. But still, the, we have to think about trade-offs between defense budgets and other budget items. And the politics is all about prioritization. So the substantial increase of defense budget without cost is just an illusion. So we have to be very honest and uh, we have to think more about what sort of trade-off we have to address. And uh, that, of course, could include uh, the, the increase in tax. So the, the people have to, have to shoulder some part of the burden, of course. And, uh, but but uh, this, this discussion is uh, only slowly starting. So the, we, we, we have to see how, 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 how this leads uh, go in the, in, the, in the coming months and years. The, Another uh, quite important uh, new element in the national security strategy and national defense strategy is the idea of acquiring what we call counter strike capability. So it is a strike capability like uh, cruise missiles and uh, longer range uh, anti ship missiles and other uh, uh, types of missiles. And, uh, and that includes uh, the standoff, uh, the missiles, uh, the air to air to air and air to ship or air to ground uh, missiles as well. And this is also a really new start for Japan because for more than seven decades, Japan didn't have such capability, but now suddenly that uh, we are going to acquire those capabilities. So it represents a huge change. So I would often say that this is Japan's Titan vendor. So the huge change, turning point in history. But uh, this idea of acquiring strike capability didn't attract much opposition. Of course, the opposition parties are still very much uh, against this. But uh, if you look at the opinion polls, the ordinary people are quite supportive of this. So five years ago, 10 years ago, it's just impossible to even think of that. But now, partly because of the war in Ukraine and also because of uh, North Korea's uh, missile and nuclear weapons development. Because last year, we had a huge record high number of North Korean missile launches, and some of which flew over Japan. And that, of course, ignited Japanese concerns about Japan's security. And also the, the heightened tensions over Taiwan, the Taiwan Strait, is also a, something that has affected uh, uh, Japan's uh, the, the, the security, uh, security concerns and security awareness among, among people. And, uh, so, and, and this document, so, so look at, uh, looking at uh, the political aspect of this document, the, one of the things that always attract a lot of attention is how we portray China. So the, and, and this document says that China presents an unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge to Japan. So this is a, a sort of a new language, but uh, it still falls short of calling China a threat. So the, but uh, this is a, a new element. And also the, when it comes to Ukraine, the national security strategy says that similar serious situation may arise in the Indo-Pacific region, especially in East Asia. So this also shows that how connected in Japan's mind, the, the situation between the situation in Ukraine and the situation in 
it stays there. So the, now let me turn to two specific issues, which are of course the, the, the connected to what I have just discussed. One is the Ukraine-Taiwan comparison, because now a lot of people are talking about what could happen the, the based on what happens in, in Ukraine, what could happen to, to, to Taiwan and how the United States would respond to a potential uh, uh, crisis over Taiwan. The one important commonalities, one of the uh, most important commonalities between Ukraine and Taiwan is that neither of them is a former ally of the United States. Ukraine is not part of NATO. Taiwan has a, the, the United States has a domestic legislation called Taiwan Relations Act. So somehow the US is committed to defense of Taiwan, but uh, it's very different from US-Japan security treaty. It's just a domestic legislation. It's not an international treaty. The, the, so, so the Taiwan is not seen as a treaty ally of the United States. So the, given the fact that so the United States is not directly intervening into the, the war in Ukraine. So the big question for us in Japan and uh, other people in, in the region is whether the United States would intervene in a conflict involving Taiwan. So the, there are two hypotheses. So starting with the discussion of why the United States is not currently intervening in the war in Ukraine. Of course, the, the weapons provision is substantial and, uh, and also the other various logistical intelligence uh, assistance to the Ukrainian forces by the United States and other NATO allies is quite substantial, but, but still the US is not a formal party to the war. And uh, the one reason why US is not in, intervening is that Ukraine is not important. Ukraine is, Ukraine is not important enough. If that's the case, you could make an argument that Taiwan is more important than Ukraine. So if the main reason of non-intervention of the United States in this war is the lack of importance of Ukraine to the United States, then it's a very bad news for Ukrainians, but good news, sort of good news for Taiwanese. Because if they can claim that Taiwan is more important than Ukraine, then you can expect American intervention. And Taiwan has good reasons to claim that, particularly now the rising importance of semiconductor industry, so TSMC and other Taiwanese companies are now seen as more important and everyone wants to get TSMC factories, so including Japan and the United States. But there could be another reason why the US is not intervening now in the war in Ukraine. It could be because the US doesn't want to, the US wants to avoid World War III U.S. wants to avoid nuclear Armageddon. That's what uh, the President Biden mentioned a couple of times. If that's the real reason why U.S. is hesitant to intervene in Ukraine, then that's a very bad news for Taiwanese and perhaps Japanese as well. Because the fact that uh, Russia has nuclear weapons, if that fact affects American calculation, then if something really serious happens in Taiwan, then the United States will have to think about the fact that China also has nuclear weapons. So Taiwan contingency is supposed to take place under Chinese nuclear shadow, just as the current war in Ukraine is done under Russian nuclear shadow. So that if the US is not prepared to do what it thinks necessary vis-a-vis -vis Russia, then how we could expect the United States to do 
what is necessary and what Japan and other US allies and partners would expect the United States to do. So the, that is why the reason why the US is not intervening in this war matters a lot for us in thinking about a potential Taiwan contingency. So this is very much about how we could address the country wanting to change the status quo by force, having nuclear weapons. So the, how we could address nuclear weapon states if they try to change the status quo by force, like Russia today, and then the, the challenge we might face over Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, and the second, uh, the, the, the topic I, I, I wanted to uh, discuss before closing, is the deepening Japan-Europe cooperation and Japan-Europe relations. So the, I talked a bit about uh, the importance of G7 for Japan. And this is really important because the G7, of course, the United States is part of G7. Okay. The, but for, for Japan, the most important element and aspect of G7 is that the Europeans are there because the US-Japan relations, that, that's there regardless of what happens in other parts of Japan's foreign security policy. So the US-Japan relationship is there, but uh, the G7 is a great place for Japanese prime minister or foreign minister or whoever attends the G7 meeting to meet European counterparts. So Japanese media, keep forgetting about the fact that the EU is formal member of G7. I, always, I, I, I always need to tell them that you, know, you, you, you need to put the EU flag in a chart showing G7, but uh, they keep forgetting about that. So the, but, but uh, the, we can meet. So, so the, at the G7 summit, and actually the G7 summit, there are nine people attending, right? And, so Japanese prime minister, US president, Canadian prime minister, and all others are from Europe. And the European Union, there are two for summit meeting. So the president of the European Commission and uh, the president of the European Council. So, the, so people say that Europe is overrepresented. Yeah, that might be quite the case, but, uh, but I assume that uh, yes, the behind EU, of course, other European countries, including of course, Ireland, is there, so, so, the, so it's, uh, it's good. So, so, so the, for, for Japanese actually, so the very important element of G7 is that we see European uh, counterparts. And when it comes to imposing sanctions on Russia, we, we have a, a talked a lot about this topic within the G7 context. So, so this is a, a really a part of a Japan-Europe policy coordination and cooperation. And also the, the role of the EU, of course, is also something that uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine and the policy coordination following that has highlighted. The, and also the, between Japan and the EU, the, there are new agendas and uh, which are very much related to uh, what we call economic security. So in Japan, everyone is now talking about the economic security. So it is about uh, the supply chain uh, security and uh, export control measures. And uh, so, so in the European context, I, I think you, you talk more in the context of resilience and, uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, and, and, and technology uh, control. Um, so, so that these are, so, so, so this area is also something that uh, the Japan and the EU could expand cooperation. And, uh, and also, not just between Japan and the EU, of course, there we need to yeah, the, 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 the align ourselves with, uh, with the United States as well. And NATO, NATO-Japan cooperation is also a, a developing quite fast. And uh, so last year, on the occasion of a NATO summit meeting in, in Madrid, where NATO's new strategic concept was uh, adopted, the, for the first time, what NATO calls AP4, the Asia Pacific Four partners. So the Australia, Japan, South Korea, and New Zealand. So the, all, the, all the 
heads of state and government uh, from four countries attended uh, the, the, the Madrid summit. And, uh, and that was really a symbolically and substantial in substantial terms as well, very important because NATO is now really busy dealing with the war in Ukraine. But still, NATO showed that given all, all what, what takes place in Ukraine, still NATO is capable of paying attention to the Indo-Pacific region. And that was quite something. And also just last week, the NATO Secretary General, Mr. Stoltenberg, visited Korea and Japan. And actually I personally hosted him, his talk at uh, my university, Keio University. And I was really impressed by Mr. Stoltenberg's very seriousness about talking to Japanese and talking to Japanese students. And he talked a lot about Russia in front of the Japanese. It's quite new because it used to be that whenever NATO Secretary General comes to Tokyo, then he pays a lot of lip services to Japan, how important Japan is for NATO, blah, blah, blah. But this time, his visit was really serious. So the, in South Korea, he urged South Koreans to send weapons to Ukraine. That's also very much part of his serious business. And in Japan, he didn't quite directly ask uh, Japanese uh, weapons uh, transfer to Ukraine, but his, the way in which he talked about Russia and China as well were really serious. And, uh, and I was quite thrilled to, to, to see that uh, just uh, sitting next to him at uh, Keio University. So the, the back to national security strategy, the, it now talks about enhancing deterrence with like-minded countries, including those in Europe. So before that, deterrence was a terminology that we only used in the context of the alliance with the United States. But now Japan is using the term, talking about deterrence in, its, in the context of its relations with uh, like-minded countries, uh, including those in Europe. So, so this is a new, sort of it could be a new start. So the, so I think I have very used my time. So, so the, I'll stop here, but I very much look forward to discussions and questions, comments, whatever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tsuruoka, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so I will avail of my prerogative as chairman to, to ask you the first question. And that is related, in fact, to the last topic you mentioned of deterrence. Mm -hmm. um, because before his uh, assassination last year, uh, former Prime Minister Abe, uh, in response to the invasion of Ukraine, talked about the need to start a discussion about nuclear weapons and possibly a nuclear sharing mm -hmm. program with other countries. Um, in the light of the more positive public reaction to the new security strategy mm -hmm. in Japan, is this something that might also become more acceptable to people in Japan, do you think? Uh, thank you very much for that question, dear. I don't think it's quite realistic to think about nuclear sharing with the United States, or of course the Japan's going nuclear is also still very much out of the question. So the, yes, the discussions are there and the interest is really high, but uh, when it comes to the, feasibility, it's still very much near to zero. And, uh, and the Japanese people are not quite supportive of any direct role in hosting nuclear weapons and uh, having nuclear weapons. But uh, what is quite interesting is that uh, there's a huge difference between Japanese discussions and uh, discussions in Korea, South Korea. Mm. So the, in South Korea, there are so many politicians now arguing for reintroduction of uh, US tactical nuclear weapons mm. on the Korean soil. And, uh, and the people are quite supportive of the idea of getting a reintroduction of US weapons. Mm. Because uh, for a long time, South Korea hosted actually nuclear weapons, US nuclear weapons on its own, on, on, on its own uh, soil. So the, yeah, but uh, so, so there is a huge difference between the situation between the two countries. Thank you. Um, we have a question from um, one of our online participants, Olena Tregu, 
from the Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Commission in Ukraine. And she asks, in fact, about South Korea. Mm -hmm. And is oh. it, uh, do you expect that they will uh, change their neutral policy and begin to supply weapons to, to Ukraine? Yeah, that's a really a tricky issue because already South Korea is selling like uh, the various kinds of ammunition to the United States. And that enables the US to supply the same kind of ammunition to Ukraine. So it's already a sort of an indirect route from Korea to the United States and to Ukraine. And, uh, and I understand that Canada too is doing a similar sort of uh, arrangement. But uh, still the South Korean, even under the current government, uh, even under the current president, the still a bit hesitant to openly do mm. such a thing. But uh, what is quite interesting is that now the role of South Korea as a defense equipment producer is growing in Europe as well. So last year we saw a unprecedented level of a, a huge contract between Poland and Korea. So Poland needs to buy 1,000 tanks from South Korea. It, mm. it's, a, it's, it's quite a lot. Mm. And uh, so, so the, looking at uh, various countries in Europe and the United States, Canada, Japan, the, we, we don't have much spare capacity of production of weapons and ammunition. But South Korea has, because South Korea is one of the very few countries in the world which maintain what we call war economy. Because the Korean War is just the armistice. So the, they have maintained a fair capacity. So the, that is now playing a big role in Europe. So the, as for Poland, yes, the Polish people say that uh, the, the buying weapons from Korea was not their first choice. Mm. But in the end, sourcing your equipment from other parts of the world makes a huge strategic sense. Because now you have war in Europe and there is no spare capacity mm. for defensive equipment here in Europe. So then, buying weapons from other parts of the world, different parts of the world. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, so I think the role of Korea mm. is set to continue and uh, I think set to increase more. Perhaps more indirectly rather than yeah. directly. Yeah, because the Poland, the fact that Poland is able to buy mm. tanks from Korea means that mm. Poland can mm. give what they already have to, to Ukraine. Mm. Is there, yes, Michael. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Sanfi, Policy Planning Unit of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. Thanks for your talk. Just with regard to the section of your remarks about the comparison between Ukraine and Taiwan, you mentioned two hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And it's just personally, the first one to, seems to me not to hold any water, whatever, which is that you, Ukraine is simply not important enough. I mean, to me, it seems overwhelmingly more likely that it's the second reason that they want to avoid World War III. So my question is, does a large section, I mean, to what extent is there a section of uh, society or whatever in Japan that actually believes that the first hypothesis has any weight whatever? You know, that, that it's a case that Ukraine is not important enough. It just seems to me absolutely not the case. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that, that, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, looking at the volume of US weapons transfer to Ukraine, yes, the US is now really serious and committed. But uh, in the early phase, early days of war, US was not that committed. So the only as a result of seeing that the Ukrainians are capable of countering Russian invasion, then the US gradually became more serious in supporting Ukraine. And also, the, it's, 
easy to say that because Ukraine is not a NATO member, US doesn't have an obligation to defend Ukraine. That's factually true, but you don't really have to have a formal treaty relationship with Ukraine if, if you really want to get involved. Because the right of collective self-defense is according to the UN Charter, is an inherent right of all nations. So the United States can, if it chooses to do so, can invoke the right of collective self-defense to Ukraine, despite the fact that Ukraine is not part of NATO. So the, and that's what the Americans have done a number of times. So for example, the most, one of the most recent cases is a global coalition against the Islamic State. So the US and the other like-minded partners conducted airstrikes against Islamic State, both in Iraq and Syria. And it was done formally, uh, when it comes to the formal procedure, it was done as a result of the request from Iraq so the, the US used the right of collective self-defense upon request from Iraqi government. But the US doesn't have a treaty alliance with Iraq. So that if you are really serious, then you can do things. But so, so the, the fact that NATO is not invo formally involved in this war is NATO's decision not to do so. So the, I think the, the Ukraine is not part of NATO is a sort of an excuse, but uh, that is not quite based on international law because the, if you are really serious, then you can do things. So from, from that perspective, I, I, I said that uh, there is a hypothesis that uh, the Ukraine is not important enough to the United States. Um, yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Rita, and I'm a Chinese studying at Trinity College Dublin. I'm working on my PhD thesis on language policy and planning in higher education. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I have basically two questions. The first one is, it seems like all of the narratives from Japanese government or normal people are hugely influenced by the strategic plan from an upper level, let's say, from the governmental level. I'm curious if there is some influence from the Asian level, say, from some neighboring countries in Asia about the, the, the beliefs or ideology concerning the Ukrainian war. Or that brings me another question about this, the, the China-US relation. How do normal Japanese people think about the, 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 the Taiwan problem or let's say the, the power relation between Chinese government and the US government? And what's the role here in this issue in East Asia Pacific about from the, the, the Japanese government perspective or from the Japanese normal people perspective? Thank you very much. If I could just add yeah. to that question, mm -hmm. um, we have a question from a f another former ambassador to mm -hmm. Japan, mm -hmm. Porig Murphy, who also asks about uh, what do people in Japan think about the Chinese reaction to the war in Ukraine? Mm. So it follows very much from that. Yeah, first starting with a, the Japanese perception about the, the Chinese reaction to the war. Yeah, it's, it's disappointing. That's quite true. And, uh, the, and also the, we see a substantial level of paradox or irony in China's reaction and China's, China's approach to the war. Because on one hand, non-intervention in other countries' business, other countries' politics, is very much part of China's very important principle of its foreign policy. But uh, what the Russians are doing now, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is just uh, the violation, brutal violation of that principle, non-intervention in other countries' politics. So the how, we are wondering how Chinese policymakers can reconcile on the one hand, the principle of non-intervention and what they are seeing in Ukraine. 
So the, and, and also the, in the Chinese language, I understand that uh, the, they don't want to use the term war or invasion. They often use the term crush, right? So the, that shows that uh, they don't want to say this is a war, this is an invasion. Because if you say this is an invasion, then the next question is, who is responsible? Mm. So it's a quite a, a interesting Chinese way of dodging the very the central issue by using the term crush. So the, when I talked to Chinese uh, experts on that, I, I, I was quite honestly impressed by that uh, way of talking about this war. And uh, the, the Japanese people's perceptions about uh, the, the US-China strategic competition, yes, they are very much concerned about that. And uh, the one of the most direct consequences we are already feeling is the export control measures. So the US is now more determined to impose stricter, much stricter export control measures against China, including semiconductor manufacturing machines and other things. And the Japanese companies are very much afraid of what sort of impact the US policy is going to have on Japan. So the, what we are now seeing is that uh, the, within companies, within private companies, now the sort of a decoupling between the section <laughs> dealing with the United States and the section dealing with China. But uh, this option is only possible for big companies. For smaller companies, they just cannot afford to do it such a thing. So the, yes, the Japanese government itself is now becoming more serious in addressing what we call economic security agenda. But uh, the, the business community is still very much concerned about the potential adverse impact of that because it's still the China business for them is really important. So the, and particularly, the Japanese companies in China, the, for those who use China only as a manufacturing base, it's relatively easy for them to leave China. But uh, for those who depend on Chinese market, in addition to using China as a manufacturing base, it's far more difficult for them to leave China. So, the, so there's no consensus in Japan on how to deal with this situation and how to address this sort of challenges. And uh, the, at the very fundamental level, what we are now wondering is where to draw a line between what is acceptable when it comes to China's behaviors, investment, and other things, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. But uh, drawing a line between the two is really difficult. But uh, how we can align ourselves between Japan and other like-minded countries, of course, including the United States. So this is still a huge challenge. And I would say that uh, there's no consensus, not only in Japan, but also in other countries as well, on how to deal with China. Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Lady Squid. I'm the Norwegian ambassador to Ireland. And a few years back, I, I worked for NATO. And I was a special representative for Women, Peace and Security. And in that job, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Japanese uh, partners uh, on the agenda. And it ended with the secondment of a Japanese colonel to the office. So we thought that was quite groundbreaking also when it came to the strategic relationship between Japan and NATO. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit uh, concretely, more concretely on what your partnership with NATO looks like today. Thank you. Great, so thank you very much. Yes, the NATO-Japan cooperation has developed over the past decade or so. Uh, the, and actually, I, I was at the embassy in Brussels from 2005 to 8, and dealing with NATO, and at the time, uh, Ambassador Mariama was a director for European policy division and dealing with NATO and uh, among other things. But uh, the other time, it was only a very 
early phase of the, the, the development of the major Japan cooperation, but now the becoming more substantial, particularly in the fields of cyber security and cyber defense and, uh, and maritime security, of course. And, uh, but uh, my personal view is that the NATO strengths, one of the NATO strengths lies in the, the standardization. So interoperability and standardization. So you have a huge accumulation of standardization agreements called STANAX. So the, and this is what Japan could learn a lot. And also given the fact that now Japan is going to do a joint development of next generation of jet fighters with the UK and Italy, which means that uh, we will be very much in the context of a NATO standardization, NATO STANAX. So the, so far we have been thinking of the adjusting to NATO standards, but uh, in, the, in the course of this new joint development of next generation of jet fighters, then we believe that uh, we will be in the, in, the, in the process of making new standardization at NATO with the participation of Japanese. And that's, that's, a, that's going to be a very new phase of standardization and interoperability cooperation between the two. And, uh, and also the, the, the reality on the ground has already developed a lot because a lot of countries, a lot of a, a increasing number of European countries have been sending ships and aircraft to Japan and to other, other parts of the Indo-Pacific region. So the one and a half years ago, we had a, a, the, the UK-led carrier strike group, so, so the, the, the aircraft carrier, uh, HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, visited Japan and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the carrier strike group stayed in the region for, 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 for many weeks actually. And, uh, and uh, we did a lot of uh, joint training, not only of course uh, between the UK carrier strike group and Japan, but also involving other uh, like-minded countries and US allies. Uh, and, uh, and Germany also is now a frequent sort of a, a visitor. So German uh, frigate uh, came to Japan uh, last year, no, one, one and a half years ago. Well, and, uh, and also the interesting thing that uh, German, the Eurofighter Typhoon uh, jet fighters also visited Japan. So this sort of a bilateral uh, defense cooperation is also a very big part of Japan, Europe, security and defense ties. So the yes, they're looking at specifically at NATO. It's NATO doesn't have any ships. So, so the NATO cannot be the one to send ships to, to, to the Indo-Pacific region, but uh, NATO countries are there. So the, and, and, and this sort of cooperation is becoming more substantial. And uh, another interesting element of this is that US is very much at the center of this because whenever European countries send ships to the region, US Navy is there to help. So the, this is from a Japanese perspective. This is about plug those European countries in to the US alliance networks in the region. So the US-Japan alliance is there and the US-Australia alliance is there. And whenever European countries come to this, come to that region, then not only the US, but the US-Japan alliance is there and the US-Australia alliance is there. And that sort of a US element is also something that uh, we, we, we can think of. We don't have very much time left, but we still have some really interesting questions. Sorry, I'd like to, too long. To, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, we have a question from Dr. Dr. Declan Downey, who is a lecturer at University College Dublin with a, a strong interest in Japan. And it's about the national defense and security strategy. Uh, you talked earlier about the, the counter-strike capability that is one of the features. But uh, Dr. Downey asks, is there a parallel policy for a protective strategy similar to Israel's Iron mm. Dome mm. policy to protect against inward attacks. Is that also a feature of the new strategy? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, missile defense is something that uh, Japan has been quite eager to develop for more than, more than 20 years. 
So the, the easy ships we deploy, mm -hmm. and also the Patriot uh, missile defense system mm -hmm. we, we operate. And we are going to add more easy capable vessels in the coming years. Okay. So the, yeah, this is a yeah, quite important part of Japan's uh, defense and deterrence posture. And, but the, a bit of sort of a caveat here is that we have been saying that our missile defense is mainly about North Korea. Mm. Because the, given the size of China's missiles, mm -hmm. it's just impossible to address and intercept all the Chinese missiles. So the, yeah, that's why we have been saying that uh, this is a limited system and uh, mainly about North Korea, but the reality is that uh, China has far more bigger, much bigger number of missiles which could reach Japan. Mm -hmm. So then we might have to think about that as well in the context of missile defense. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, Derry Fitzgerald, um, I'm a member of the Institute and um, uh, coming from a defense background. Um, I, I noted your answer to the ambassador here beside me uh, on the relationship with NATO. Um, of course, NATO being dominated by the European countries and its um, standardization that it brings with its stanags and so forth. What about a, a more localized defense pact? Is there any prospect for a more localized defense pact that Japan could enter with? What, what do you mean? Well, with it... Korea, for instance. With oh. Korea. Uh, would, you, would you see a future in that? Yeah, great question. Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I personally cannot be quite optimistic about the prospect of Japan Korea security and defense cooperation. But at least, we should be able to deal with immediate challenges together. And not only together between Japan and Korea, but in the context of US, Japan, Korea, trilateral cooperation. So the yeah, technical cooperation has been there, but uh, when it comes to moving to a political and strategic level, then the, the, all the political and problems are still there, and uh, we have to uh, address those issues, those political issues, before uh, thinking of more substantial uh, security and defense ties. But uh, quite interestingly, that uh, the Japan has been expanding strategic cooperation, and including, of course, security and defense ties, with a increasing number of countries in Southeast Asia. So ASEAN countries. So they just this week, and perhaps now, the the the, the Filipino president is visiting Tokyo, and uh, Philippines is actually one of the closest strategic security and defense partners for Japan in the region. And uh, so this is a sort of a new new uh, development, and also the Vietnam is a quite important strategic partner for Japan. So the, so they say more security and defense ties, including uh, the capacity building in the defense domains. It's something that Japan has been doing nearly 10 years now. So the bilaterally and also in the context of the multilateral frameworks in the region, including the ADMM plus, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting plus, that's a 10 ASEAN countries plus countries, uh, a, a framework. And it's, it's quite, a, quite a vibrant and uh, interesting new framework. But, uh, the, but, but, but still, the, when it comes to substantial uh, assistance and substantial uh, relationship, the, we are, we have been uh, developing bilateral relations with, particularly with the Philippines and, and Vietnamese, Vietnam as well. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Paul Gillespie, who is in the UCD School of Politics and International Relations. And he's also well known to everybody here as an Irish Times columnist. And his question is about the developing discussion in and between the European Union and ASEAN, um, about how closer interregional cooperation between them could help to mitigate uh, the polarization caused by 
US on one side and China on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that Japan could contribute to the, this discussion? Yeah, the, the strategic importance of ASEAN is on the rise. So the, now everyone is talking about the strengthening relations with ASEAN. So ASEAN is quite popular. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that uh, the ASEAN is seen as a very important sort of a China plus destination of foreign direct investment. So the, now uh, out of a concerns about uh, the security of global supply chain, now that we are encouraged to not too much focus on China, so that at least China plus alpha is needed. And in that context, the, the, the importance of ASEAN has increased quite a lot. And, uh, and Japan has been in ASEAN for many, many years. And, uh, and it's really good that uh, the Europeans are now paying more attention mm -hmm. to, to, to ASEAN. And uh, so the and, and a very important element of this is that the ASEAN people, ASEAN countries and ASEAN people are very much concerned about the, the you say, the polarization. Mm -hmm of the world between China and the United States, and they don't want to take the side. Mm. So the China is there, it's just impossible for Southeast Asians to kick out Chinese. It's just impossible, they are there. And uh, they don't want to be seen as anti-Chinese. But at the same time, they are also concerned about adverse effect of Chinese presence, mm. not only in economic terms, but also political and security terms as well. So the, what they need is hard choice, alternatives. And that's what Japan is trying to ensure in ASEAN countries that, uh, for, for example, thinking about the infrastructure project, if there is only one proposal that is China, Chinese, mm -hmm. then you have no other choice. But uh, if you have alternatives, then you can choose. Mm -hmm. So the Japan's approach is not to kick out Chinese from Southeast Asia, because we know it's impossible. And also the, we don't really think that uh, the kicking Chinese out is uh, good for them. But, uh, but uh, always, always ensure that there are alternatives. That is important. And that's also very much part of a Japan-EU, what we call connectivity partnership. So they're ensuring that there are always alternatives mm -hmm. and alternatives that are better in terms of transparency, sustainability. And these are the things that uh, the, we can do, the Japan can do to cooperate with the European Union, including in Southeast Asia. Okay. Well, unfortunately we have gone over our time. So I have to bring this discussion to an end, but it's been a really fascinating discussion. And I think we've all enjoyed listening to you and very much. And I think we've all learned a great deal from listening to you as well. So on behalf of everybody, I would like to thank you very sincerely for coming here today and talking to us at such length. Thank you very much.